World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. French forces on the island of Corsica are said to have captured the last German evacuation port of Bastia, while three allied forces on the Italian mainland have all made new gains. The Red Army is smashing on toward the German base at Gomel, and four Russian spearheads are threatening the eastern border of White Russia. Allied planes are back over the continent in force today as the British observe the third anniversary of their victory over the Luftwaffe. And in the Pacific, Australian troops are within three quarters of a mile of the Jap base at Finchhofen, New Guinea. Now, Admiral Radio takes you direct to Algiers. John Daly reporting. In the battles of the Italian mainland, the Fifth Army has driven another mile into the strongly held mountain positions of the enemy north and northeast of Salerno. Although progress has been slow immediately above Salerno, the right flank of the Fifth Army has made substantial gains. In the last six days, the American forces there have advanced 30 miles against stiff opposition and now hold an unbroken front along what are described as various key roads. The Fifth Army line is straightened out and runs about due east out of the hills overlooking Naples. Meanwhile, in eastern Italy, the British Eighth Army is likewise in sight of its objective. Racing up the Adriatic coast yesterday, the British forces reached the mouth of the Ocanto River and entered the plain of Foggia, netting gains of from 25 to 30 miles along its entire front and still meeting with no opposition, the 8th drew into position to engulf the Foggia Plain, which holds a vitally important system of airfields. The main airfield, just outside the city of Foggia, was an important civil and military airdrome in times of peace. With it now are 12 satellite fields within a 20-mile radius of the city. The whole of Albania, Yugoslavia, and Greece are within close bombing distance from these fields, while Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Austria would be within easy reach of our heavy bombers. The naples Foggia line is the logical place for the Germans to make a determined stand. If they don't, it may mean a steady withdrawal to the Po Valley in the north, covered by the now familiar demolitions and skillful rearguard actions. A French communique issued just a short while ago speaks of steady pressure on the German forces contained in the northeast corner of Corsica. Three new towns on the hills about eight miles outside of Bastia have been occupied by French patriots and regular troops and the road junction west of Bastia, which leads up into the Corsican Finger, has been captured. The communique also reports sharp fighting in the district of Casamosa, 15 miles south of Bastia. Many prisoners were taken, and the Germans suffered severe losses. The Air Force yesterday struck another large feather in its cap by making the second 1,400-mile round trip this month to blast Bolzano, Bologna, and Verona in northern Italy. Both Bologna and Balzano, which is only 30 miles from the Brenner Pass, a vital control point for rail traffic into Italy from Germany. Both took a heavy pounding from formations of our flying fortresses. The railway yards at Verona were also attacked and bombs were dropped on a highway near Florence. About 24 enemy fighters attempted to intercept. Four of them were shot down. There can be little doubt that their forces are stretched very thinly since in heavy operations by our medium bombers and fighters in central Italy yesterday, only four enemy fighters were sighted and one of these was destroyed. The Air Force also took a hand in the Corsica fighting. B-25 medium bombers struck at the Bastia Borgo airfield in Corsica, a blow at any German hopes of continued evacuation by air. Now back to CBS in New York. More news in just a moment, but first here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. In the latter part of December 1942, a shock force of British regulars and native troops under Brigadier Wingate slashed out from India into the center of Jaffel Burner. The expedition was not a large one. There were no armored units, artillery, or supply trucks. But in its successful conclusion, radio, some of it perhaps admiral equipment, played a vital role. Except for destroying enemy communications, the aim of this raid was largely experimental. To test the possibility of supplying such units entirely by air and to gain first-hand knowledge of jungle warfare. For almost five months, these raiders fought their way through dense, tangled jungles, over unbridged rivers, and through the rocky passes of the mountains of central Burma, over 1,200 miles covered entirely by foot. 
During this time, the sole means of communication with the outside world was by radio. Radio formed the link that kept a steady stream of plane-borne supplies flowing into their hands. The food, ammunition, medical supplies that are the lifeblood of military movements. The wartime duties of your peacetime admiral are dramatically illustrated by such cases as this. Though entirely devoted to war production now, to you on the home front, Admiral gives this assurance. The skill and effort now going into weapons of war will be yours when victory has been won in the new Admiral, America's smart set. And now, once again, here's Doug Edwards. Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS London. Charles Collingwood reporting. This is Battle of Britain Sunday over here. The British have a rather nice habit of setting aside a Sunday every now and then to give thanks for some great event of the war. And all over Britain today, in thousands of little churches, people came to thank God that the Battle of Britain had made it possible for them to be still in the war today. In London, it was a big church, and the king and queen went to the great cathedral of St. Paul's and sang, God, our help in ages past, and heard the Archbishop of Canterbury. But the most moving thing about this Battle of Britain Sunday is that all the people all over the country knew what that battle meant in terms of their lives and the lives of their children and the lives of the men who died that it might be won. But the war goes on, of course, and with it all of the little things that we must look to if we want to know what the big things are. One such little thing that is being talked about in London is the new dispute between General Giraud and General de Gaulle. The French in London, most of whom, it should be said, are de Gaullists, are rather upset about the reports which have been coming out of Algiers. They are particularly upset about John Daly, a fellow CBS correspondent's story. And I report this as a matter of news interest. The story that de Gaulle feels that Giraud took unfair advantage of him in Corsica. The French here in London say that it isn't a Giraud-de Gaulle squabble at all but rather that Giraud took certain decisions about Corsica on his own responsibility. And the French say that it is a French democratic tradition that generals should always be subordinate to the civil authority, in this case, the committee. So where the supporters of the French National Committee differ from Mr. Daly is that this controversy is not a matter of jealousy between Giraud and de Gaulle, but instead it is a question of principle involving the authority of the whole committee. I return you now to New York. Allied planes from the Middle East Command continue to join the attack against Southern Europe amidst increasing reports of imminent new landings by our troops. For a direct account, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Cairo. James Fleming reporting. The Allied operations in the Greek and Italian islands within the Aegean Sea are continuing. But again today, we have only the news of air activity to report. Yesterday... All fighters of the Royal Air Force attacked an enemy destroyer that had run aground at Cape Prasinisi on the southern tip of the island of Rhodes. The bullfighters scored cannon strikes on the vessel, starting small fires. The destroyer appeared to be badly damaged. On Friday night, the target was an aerodrome on Crete. RAF Hudson's and Baltimore's on the field at Castelli Tediada in the interior of the island, causing fires. From these and other Allied operations in the Middle East, no Allied aircraft is missing. Some of the public pronouncements from the frightened collaborators in Hitler's satellite states are beginning to read like the memoirs of a tightrope walker. Here's the latest from Hungary. After the meeting of the Hungarian Prime Minister and Chief of Staff with Hitler, the cabinet held a meeting and issued a circular explaining what was called Hungary's position in the defense of Europe. The circular states that Hungary cannot play a positive part in case of an invasion of the Balkans, because Hungary is not a Balkan state. Then it goes on to deny that Hungary has sent troops into the Balkans. Finally, in a kind of watered-down punchline, the statement concludes that Hungary is interested in the Balkans only as a neighbor. A nervous neighbor, they might have added. Even the Nazi-dominated Bulgarian army, on which Hitler is depending for occupation garrisons to replace Italians within the Balkans, begins to display a case of cold feet. It's reported that they've stopped at the Yugoslav border and refused to cross the frontier into Albania, despite a strong German demand that they do so. For the Bulgars, the sight of strong allied forces just across the Adriatic in Italy is just too discouraging. 
This is James Fleming in Cairo. And I'll return you to New York. In this country, President Roosevelt has announced the appointment of a new Under Secretary of State. For this news and other developments on the home front, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington, Robert Lewis reporting. President Roosevelt's appointment of Edward R. Statinius, Jr. as the new Under Secretary of State and his establishment of a new Office of Foreign Economic Administration is being interpreted here as a move to bolster the State Department for the many post-war problems which already are developing on the international front. As Lend-Lease Administrator, Statinius became acquainted at first hand with many of the problems confronting the various countries of the United Nations. And in both that capacity and in his former position as Chairman of the Board of the United States Steel Corporation, he was in a position to know his own country's needs and aims. In Congress, his confirmation seems assured. Both Democratic and Republican members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee have said that his appointment will be well received. In announcing Statinius's appointment, the President also revealed officially that Sumner Wells had resigned. In the consolidation of the various agencies dealing with foreign economic matters into the new Office of Foreign Economic Administration, the President named Leo T. Crawley as the administrator. He will be in complete charge of all operations subject only to State Department direction and policy. Former Governor Herbert Lehman, who resigned simultaneously from his Foreign Relief and Rehabilitation Post, was appointed Special Assistant to the President. He is expected to work out the details of the forthcoming United Nations Relief Conference to be held here in Washington in November. And it's understood that Lehman will be this country's nominee for the chairmanship of that conference and its resulting inter-allied commission. On the home front, the administration apparently has set the stage for another congressional battle over subsidies. The War Food Administration has announced a $100 million milk subsidy program, and it's understood that it's also preparing to ask for an extension and enlargement of the Commodity Credit Corporation. In the third war loan drive, the Treasury says now that we are within $1,695,000,000 of the goal. This is Robert Lewis in Washington, now back to CBS New York and Doug Edwards. The Red Army's latest successes pose a great many problems for the German high command. For a summary of these problems, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. Today, the great military question regarding the Russian front is this. Can the Germans hold on the line of the River Dnieper? At the moment, the Russians are engaged in mopping up the remnants of German resistance in the salient between fallen Smolensk and still resisting Gomel. They are hammering heavily at all the German bridgeheads on the left bank of the Dnieper from Kiev down to Zaporozhye. None of these bridgeheads have fallen as yet, and so far there is no report that indicates that the, German, the Russians have anywhere crossed the Dnieper in force, though it is quite possible that patrols may have reached the western bank. West and southwest of Smolensk, the Russians are driving for the vital railway junctions of Vitebsk, strategic pivot of the German northern front, Arsha, main supply base for that front, and Moilev. Farther south, Gomel is threatened. And below that, the Russians are in the eastern suburbs of Kiev itself. German resistance seems to be stiffening all along the southern part of the front. For example, the Russians have not yet reported the cutting of the Crimean Railway in the Melitopol area, though three days ago, they were reported within five miles of the town of Melitopol. We must keep in mind the increasing difficulties of the Russians in the matter of supply. They have wrought veritable miracles so far in maintaining their advance so far from their railheads. They cannot do so indefinitely without a pause to enable their railway engineers to catch up with them and to reconstitute their forward depots. It may be that German resistance along the Dnieper will bring about the occasion, indeed the necessity, for that pause. But we do not know as yet whether that will be the case. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. Standing by at a CBS microphone in Honolulu are two Navy men who played important parts in our recent attacks on Japanese installations in the Gilbert Islands. For their stories, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. A week ago, vigorous attacks by our carrier aircraft and land-based Army and Navy planes were made on the Japanese-held Gilbert Islands and Nauru. Just returned are Commander Leonard B. Sutherland of Fort Payne, Alabama, who commanded a carrier air group, 
and Lieutenant Commander Ernest M. Snowden of Beaufort, North Carolina, a dive bomber squadron commander. Now, what was the purpose of the attack, Commander Sutherland? Following the announced policy of hitting the Jap wherever he is, wherever possible, to do him the most damage, it was an attempt to neutralize these important bases. It was also excellent training for our men for a bigger job ahead. Uh, how was it carried out? The Army hit Toronto with B-24s Friday night from midnight to around 4.30 with 25 tons of bombs. At the same time, other four motor bombers, both Army and Navy of the same type, attacked Nauru with similar bomb tonnage. Next morning, our carrier bombers and fighters struck Tarawa. Some Jap fighters came up at Nauru, but none at Tarawa. However, we encountered heavy anti-aircraft fire. The fighters strafed the anti-aircraft positions and, together with the bombers, knocked out from 50 to 60 percent. Each bomber pilot was assigned a target on the first track. From then on until noon, they were reassigned primary targets. Or if these had been destroyed, any target of opportunity. They dropped 80 tons of bombs. My group alone used up 55,000 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. About mid-morning, I counted nine Jap bombers burning on the ground, and three more counted later. Uh, your fighters were flying the new F-6F fighter, Commander. Yes, but we had no chance to match them up with the zero for none came up at Tarawa until the second army attacked the day after we left. They met 18-0, they evidently rushed in from the marshals, and the big bombers got six of them while dropping 35 tons of bombs. The F-6F is a fast, rugged plane. My group had 40 planes shot up, but in the entire operation, only four planes, two dive bombers, a torpedo bomber, and a fighter were lost. None of the Army or Navy four motor bombers were down. The damage to the Jap base was quite heavy, 45 or 50 percent destroyed. Uh, what about the dive bombers, Lieutenant Commander Snowden? Well, I saw quite a few explosions and fire start up my bombs. Uh, the fighters are everywhere, and the tracer bullets look like hoses pouring out red lead. Uh, when the dive bombers were diving and ran into clouds obscuring the targets, the pilots would pull out of the dive and make a run all over again, regardless of the heavy air fire. Uh, one fighter pilot came back with some palm leaves hanging on his guns. Uh, he was coming in low, got into some smoke, and when he came through it, there was another plane coming right at him. He swerved over... And his guns guys out lay us on a tree. Uh, one highlight was our last dive bomber attack. Uh, on the return, we looked back and saw some tremendous columns of smoke. I think the fire started from bombs that set off an ammunition dump. Well, Commander Sutherland, do you feel the Japs were caught napping? Uh, no, I think in his large defense parameter keeps him pretty, uh, spread pretty thin. It looks like the Jap is going to have quite a bit of worrying about where to put his available fighter planes from now on. Thank you, Commander Leonard B. Sutherland, Air Group Commander, Lieutenant Commander Ernest M. Snowden, Dive Bomber Squadron Commander, with this story of the Gilbert Islands attack. Good luck. This is Robert E. Edwards in Honolulu. I return you now to New York. At almost any hour, we may have word of another major success against the Japs on New Guinea. General MacArthur reports that Australian troops beating down bitter Jap resistance have moved within three quarters of a mile of the enemy base at Finchhofen. And over on the Asiatic mainland, American medium bombers have again hit Jap installations in Burma. A communique from New Delhi tells of four buildings being destroyed in the Memao area east of Mandalay. Our bombers also attacked Japanese shipping in a sweep of the upper Irrawaddy River, and they scored a direct hit on one large ship. Here in our New York studio, wearing the uniform of an American war correspondent, is Robert P. Martin, just returned from Chungking. He's been five and a half years in the Far East, most of it covering the battlefronts and events in the capital of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's government. We've been reading and hearing a lot the past couple of weeks of an impending offensive under Lord Louis Mountbatten to reconquer Burma as a step in carrying the war to Japan's homeland. Tell us, Mr. Martin, what, from your first-hand knowledge, are the prospects? General Marshall's recent statement that the Allies are getting into position to launch a big attack against the Japs in the China-Burma theater was one of the most cheering statements the Chinese have heard in their long struggle. To them, the reopening of Burma has long been a mirage in the desert of this global war, always tantalizingly present, but always just out of reach. Are the Chinese convinced that if we reopen Burma, we can start hitting the Japs in their home islands? It isn't quite as easy as that. A reconquest of Burma doesn't mean that China would at once be turned into a great base for operations against Japan. Chinese leaders with whom I have talked admit that the Burma Road's former capacity of from 12 to 15,000 tons of freight a month in good weather can't be more than tripled, even under strict military control. And 45,000 tons a month certainly will not equip and maintain China's armies. It will take American naval victories to do that. We'll have to reopen one or more Chinese ports. 
Well, from what you say, Mr. Martin, maybe an offensive to reopen Burma wouldn't be worth the cost. Is that true? Oh, no. Its benefits would be enormous. For instance, it would facilitate the movement of supplies to General Chenault's 14th Air Force, also to Chinese troops defending Chenault's air bases. Furthermore, China would obtain machinery for her almost worn-out war factories. Then I take it that the Second Battle of Burma will be essentially a battle of supply. That's it, exactly. And before we open up Burma, the Allies, the British, the Chinese, the Indians, and ourselves, will have to go through a lot of tough fighting. Our American and British bombers, despite the monsoon, have been constantly hammering the Jap lines of communication and Jap supply bases. It's true that our own lines of communication are not being subjected to this sort of pressure. But you must remember that it is more than 15,000 miles from the American assembly lines to the Burma front. Last week, I flew from Chungking to the United States in six and a half days. But only the most urgent personnel and supplies, and only limited quantities of them, can cover the distance at that speed. The rest, the bulk of our aid, goes by slow freighter. And sometimes under the pressure of demands from other fronts in this global war, those freighters aren't available immediately. Most of us know that Burma is a pretty tough spot for waging war, but I wonder if we realize just how tough it really is. Well, Mr. Edwards, I recently visited the battle areas on both the Burma-India and the Burma-China frontiers. And I can tell you this. You can let your imagination run wild, and you probably won't be exaggerating. The main lines of communication are mountain trails worn deep through the century by plodding natives. These trails run through steamy, malaria-infested jungles. Tremendous mountains rear up on all sides. Travel isn't reckoned in miles, but in hours or days. Water and food are at a premium. But the Chinese have proved in these past few months, as have Brigadier Wingate's British jungle fighters, that the Japs can be beaten in Burma. They can be beaten in Burma just as they have been beaten in the jungles of New Guinea. I'm sure they can, and I'm sure they will be. And thank you very much, Robert P. Martin. And now, once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a message from our sponsor. Not only on the battlefield is radio demonstrating its vital usefulness in this war, there is an equally important part being played guarding our shores here at home. So essential has radio proved itself in the operation of the Civil Air Patrol that many states have conducted special drives for funds to provide patrol planes with two-way radio equipment. For example, a special appropriation was recently made by the General Assembly of the State of Virginia for this very purpose. With the facilities of the Admiral plants entirely devoted to building such instruments, make it a part of your home front duties to conserve your radio, which has now become irreplaceable. Call your Admiral dealer in case of emergency and be assured that he will do everything in his power to keep your set in working order. After the war, Admiral, in peacetime, the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers, will bring you the new Admiral, America's smart set. Attention, men and women of Chicago. Your country needs you. Help build vital communication equipment for our frontline fighters at the great Admiral plants in Chicago. The work is easy and interesting. No experience is necessary, and you'll be paid while learning. The factories are modern with the latest type machinery, as well as company cafeterias for your convenience. Simply go to the employment office of the Admiral Plant at 4150 North Knox Avenue by taking a Montrose streetcar to 4600 West. Or take the Armitage Avenue car to the Admiral Plant at 3815 Armitage Avenue. Get into radio now. The modern business with a great future. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when the Continental Radio and Television Corporation again brings you World News Today, direct from the leading news centers of the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to the WBBM Air Theater, Rigby Building, Chicago.